Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Officially, it's called the Jefferson National Expansion Monument, and it was a design opportunity announced in a 1948 anonymous competition. This competition attracted the likes of architects such as Louis Kahn, Walter Gropius, Ralph Rapson, and both Eliel and Eero Saarinen. Today we know it as Eero Saarinen's St. Louis Gateway Arch. But once again, we find that just maybe Benito Mussolini might have influenced American post-war modern architecture. The arch is a monument to the city of St. Louis as well, the first American city west of the Mississippi, and by that I mean on the west bank of the Mississippi, and the gateway to the west. In the book, Life on the Mississippi, Mark Twain wrote that he should have bought St. Louis the first time he saw it, as small and drab as it was, because when he returned a few years later, it was vibrant, expensive, and much beyond his means. St. Louis was the home to some of America's greatest breweries, the first national brands, and the only Major League Baseball team west of the Mississippi until 1958. Thomas Jefferson's Corps of Discovery, led by Lewis and Clark, left from a spot very near here where the Missouri and Mississippi River connect. It's an amazing tale of how the small band of people traveled across the northern part of the Louisiana Purchase. Delving into the people who made their journey, the technology they developed and took with them, their preparedness and their cleverness along the route is a rewarding historical read for anyone. I suppose it has not been made into a major motion picture recently because aside from one case of what was probably appendicitis early on, there was no loss of life. Or perhaps today's sensitive audiences might be offended because the men, woman, and baby, American and Native American, acted as people of their time instead of like today's glitterati, hollywoke actors. The Gateway Arch is the Eiffel Tower of St. Louis. But unlike the Eiffel Tower, which was originally rejected by Parisians, the Gateway Arch was immediately embraced by the people of St. Louis as their architectural identity. We can see that because when my parents made a business trip to St. Louis in 1965, they brought back these souvenirs. Saren's monument design evolved during the course of the competition from early gate structures into the parabolic arch form that we know today. Arches as gateways and monuments go back to ancient Rome. Returning victorious generals would have arches constructed in their honor, depicting their achievements in bas relief. This motif has been repeated all around the world, such as in Paris or New York City. So it would not be unreasonable to believe that on his own, and with his own genius creative intellect, Eero Saarinen and his structural engineer, Hans Karl Bandel of Severod Associates, would move logically to a pure structure, a catenary, or a parabolic arch, which could stand on its own, free of bulk, and as an elegant and abstract expression of gait on the banks of the Mississippi, and hovering like a halo over St. Louis's courthouse dome. The parabola is pure structural expression. As an arch, it pushes down in total compression. Upside down, in tension, it forms itself into a pure parabola. Just consider a string held on two ends. A parabola is formed because the string is allowed to deform according to the stresses on it and express itself in tension. The Romans perfected the use of the round top arch, but always had the problem of the lateral forces at the spring line. The parabola arch does not have that problem. And they dealt with that lateral force by bulking up the sides or occasionally putting it into a complete ring so that all the arches would push against the arch next to it. 
In medieval times, the Gothic cathedrals used the pointed arch, a form closer to the parabola, and the flying buttress to make the structure in its totality more parabolic. But eventually we see pure parabolas, such as those at Sagrada Familia, Architecture Codex No. 2, by Antonin Gaudí in Barcelona, and the Cellar Modernista by Cesar Martinel y Brunet at a vineyard in Catalonia, Spain, and even as shell structure at the La Concha Motel in Las Vegas by architect Paul R. Williams. But Eero Saarinen was not the first person to propose such a form. Drawings for a similar arch appear in the early designs of Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini's pet architecture project, the Esposizione Universale Roma, known today as AOR. This World's Fair touting the achievements of Mussolini's new Rome was set for 1942. Planning was done by master architect Marcello Piancentini, and it was partially built, but the project was abandoned, interrupted by that minor inconvenience known as World War II. In Architecture Codex No. 10, I drew a parallel between the design of Aor and the Rockefeller Empire State Plaza, the Capitol Complex in Albany, New York. The AOR arch proposed was a concrete one, and it was designed by a team that included Aldalberto Libera and the great architect engineer Pierre Luigi Nerve. It would have been about as high, but much wider than Saarinen's arch, and it had a rectangular shape projected into the air, while Saarinen's was an equilateral triangle. Later, the Italian team decided it should be built of Italian aluminum. These are just minor technical differences only. The ideas are essentially the same. The AR arch was never built, but Nerve's Palazzo dello Sport, completed in 1960 for the Rome Olympics, stands nearby. Today, a local municipal group is interested in building the AR arch, the main obstacles being not just the expense, but its close association with Italian fascism. I cannot find any direct evidence that Saarinen's arch was influenced by the Aor arch. Perhaps this is the elephant in the room about which no one wants to talk. It is possible, perhaps even likely, that architects around the world knew about the Aor arch. And architects have been borrowing design ideas since construction started in Mesopotamia about 7,000 years ago. Ideas are like honeybees floating from architecture flower to architecture flower until an edifice is produced. And if Aerosarinen was inspired by Aor, he may not have discussed it as it might have been considered cheating or the association with fascism may have been considered distasteful. When Jean Chalgrin built the Arche de Triomphe for Napoleon, he was proud that it was inspired by ancient Roman architecture. And one of my architecture professors once told our class, look, if you're going to steal ideas, steal the good ones. It is also likely that given the logical simplicity and the structural imperative of the design that they were developed independently. Great minds can think alike. It is not uncommon for an architect or an artist to have an idea, and while they're working towards its completion, someone comes along and gets there first, and it makes the second one look like a copy of the first when that was not the case. Still, I would feel much more comfortable if people would talk about this a little more openly, and perhaps with praise for both teams of architects and engineers. The St. Louis Arch is 630 feet wide and 630 feet tall about 50 stories. It has an observation room at the top that can hold about 120 people and would deflect about 18 inches in 150 mile per hour winds. It is composed of 142 stainless steel skinned equilateral triangular steel sections and the steel itself weighs about 5,200 tons, about the same as the Titanic. It is majestic, symbolic, and awesome in every sense of the word. Local 396 Ironworker, 
Dean Sample's daughter, Christine, said her dad felt there was a special family feel to the workers on this project, as they knew they were doing something different, something that would last for many hundreds of years after they passed on. And they were never worried that the two halves of the arch would meet. And on October 28, 1965, when a crane lifted the last piece, the keystone, nine tons of triangular steel into place, they were proven right. Workers still get together annually at an Arch Meet the Builders event. Part of the fun of tall buildings is ascending to the top. There is a delightful and ingenious little tram designed by elevator engineer Dick Bowser that takes 6,700 people to the top of the arch every day. The tram itself was built in 1967 and reminds me of the pods in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was made in 1968. Both are utilitarian white spheres, and as we were riding the tram to the top of the arch, I had a fear that we would get there, and I would ask, open the tram doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. You know, I still won't buy the Nest thermostat because it reminds me too much of the HAL 9000 computer. At the base of the arch, there's a 90 acre park with five miles of trails and a place where you can take a riverboat ride. There's also a very good museum about the core of discovery. When I saw it a few years ago, it might've felt dated like a low tech Disney animatronic display using 1960s robot technology and stuffed animals. Some might've considered the history less inclusive than it could be. My wife, a school teacher, was aghast at the awful spelling of Lewis and Clark's log entries, but this was before the first American dictionary was published in 1828. The museum has since been updated, and I am curious to go back to see the improvements. It involves a lot of interactive and tactile displays about life during the expansion, and my wife wants to know if they corrected the spelling. Aeroserenin's design has been heralded universally from the start. It has become one of those creations of humankind that once constructed cannot be unimagined. No other building or monument would look right in that location. And like Grant Wood's American Gothic painting, it has become the subject of perennial parody. You know you are loved when people are willing to joke with you. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.